go into this like Rhiannon I guess we've already said hi to each other and yeah. we're all here yeah. so what I'll do I'm just going to spend three or four minutes like framing um, because we've never seen you all in kind of one notional space or met Helen or Janice before even I've met you Deborah which is lovely um, so I just wanted to share a little bit of how um, Rhiannon and I came to work together, um, how we approached the exhibition, and then just a little bit about the Sears in Residence Research model because it's, it's adaptable for all learning environments. And so, but you, you might not have like absorbed or had time to look at, at, at what the ground rules are for it. Um, so, to begin with like framing the work as individual artists Rhiannon and I have like very different interests and directions in our practice so Rhiannon's is based on social practice often creating environments and for people to gather and talk so very much relational um, my own practice locates dialogue of collaboration um, and also decentralization so this kind of morphing out in, into a bleeding rather than staying as an insular claimant of, of territory um, and that's mostly focused on um, other artists or practitioners of other disciplines um, though not exclusively so in 2014 Rian and I were invited to undertake a residency by Professor Michael Pinchbeck who's a playwright and an artist and um, a pedagogue and it was part of a series that, that he was curating called the drawing board and Rhiannon and I were sixth in that series with the drawing board number six and it was situated on an old Victorian staircase in a, um, a disused like school or a repurposed school it, it's now um, forms the primary studio complex for artists um, and at the top of this at the top of the staircase it's literally just on a transient space it's a staircase that still has the original chalkboard at the top of it even though it's been removed since our residency and um, so we were engaging with that but as, as as visual artists our engagement with writing quickly took a turn away from the production of text so it became a broader um, visual and performed investigation into the site and the materiality of writing and the place of the body as a scripting phenomena um, and that's kind of constantly writing and scripting itself in relation to, to uh, um, in proximity to like myriad otherness, like everything that the body is contingent upon. So we abandoned any form of recognizable text. So the residency became about subverting written language by returning to the gesture and the instinct and the materiality um, and, and the mark making that, pre, that predates fixivity. So like everything that goes into the body and the material before it becomes language. Um, and it's kind of this area that our collaboration operates in. The way our collaboration works, it's, it's intermittent, it's organic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's one way of describing it's all, it. <laughs> it's, it's, organic, it's intermittent. It's, all, it's always bubbling in the gaps, and then suddenly it erupts into a different space and context. So, it it it's not um, it's not very tightly framed or organised, <laughs> and got its own life. So, so together. Um, in the exhibiting, um, we consider the geographical sites of Chalk and the original reg residency site of the Victorian st School Staircase and our own bodies as a site. So in addition to this, we also extend the site specificness to the exhibiting context. And so for the glass tank, we approach the plate glass architecture as an aquarium uh, that could be utilized as a research lab. So there's a connection between the idea of the aquarium and the materiality of the chalk in the um, past marine lives that have laid it down. 
and we wanted to create a ground for like a living um, kind of research ecology. So the works we selected for and created within the exhibition to us have an unsettled status. They're existing somewhere between documentation and somewhere between artwork and survey and some kind of machines that aren't clear to us um, that we love. So um, they encompass photography with attention also paid to the materiality of the photograph and the photographic print. Um, drawing, made and found objects distilled from ephemeral gestures um, and performative encounters. So um, this, there's quite a lot of unfitness in the process. It's like we're doing something, what will emerge rather than following a vision that we're trying to reconstruct. Um, so that's, that's the exhibiting at Glass Tank. Um, the research model, just in case it's useful for you, um, was developed by myself in 2012 as, as a tool for my own practice. Um, but, it, but it was also to be an open resource for other creative practitioners across disciplines. And um, there, there's some like basic grounding for the model. Um, First of all, um, invited researchers spend a continuous three hours with the work, um, interacting with material of the initiating artists. So it's, it, it might not, you know, you don't have to view yourself as a lead, um, but you do have some obligations. Um, all material and architectural components can be altered, but return to original state at the end of the three hours unless the invite specifically gives the freedom to destroy, replace and resituate. Um, which when I first ran the model, I gave that permission and I was stunned at how polite the researchers were. I was expecting to not have an exhibition at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but everybody kind of self-censored, um, which was interesting. Um, the initiating artists, should not be present to witness the residences, the residences so that the seers in residence do not feel encumbered or presided over in their endeavours. Within two to three weeks of undertaking the residency, as you know, the researchers submit approximately a thousand word text. This can be in a tone of their own deciding, academic, anecdotal, uh, creative, and it might reflect, be reflective of the art or an investigation or all of these things, but it should be through the lens of the researcher's own practice. It should be relevant to them. It should be pushing the, their own, um, you know, that the, the exhibition is, is a hook for them to research their own rather than be researching ours for us. So even though the Sears in residence own copyright to all their own material, there is a generosity that they provide their text and documentation for circulation to fellow participants and to the initiating artists. The materials can be published online and hard copies in talks, seminars, publications and exhibitions with the artist duly credited and clearly not presented as the initiating artist's own work. Sears in residence can be adapted to the teaching environment enabling students to open the dialogues present in their own emergent practices and as a method of practical critique. The model aims to be manageable, insightful and unresting as it extends the scope of an individual's practice um, through the previously unconsidered lenses that you're looking through. It is also beneficial to the exhibiting space by resisting being static in an exhibition um, and creating ongoing activity through the life of an exhibition. In terms of if you use it as a model and you are an initiating artist, it comes with a commitment from the convener or source of invitation to provide quality documentation in order that the seer has a resource to aid their reflection and without possibly being hindered in producing their own, and a publication to share the research. So the publication can be viewed as printed material, online material, a seminar, a public event, a further exhibiting context. So, you know, your research now has its own life, and together you, you could exhibit your own research 
you know, you can jettison kind of what Rhiannon and I laid down because your own research is taking its own life. And, you know, so it, your, the publication of your research might enter other exhibitions that, that you initiate. Um, and that's, that's basically it. That was just like a run through of our approach to the exhibition and our approach to research and the model that, that's adaptable. Um, and, you know, you, if you, if you use the model, I would, I wouldn't mind if you, if you said it, that it's a model that I developed or if it's adapted from the model that I developed because I'm a freelancer. Um, so like my intellectual property right is it quite, it leaches out into institutions that don't support me. Um, so, but it's, but it's, it's, it's it, it, it's just it, 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 it's an open resource. I, I don't want any barriers to it being used. So, um, okay, Th thanks, Tracy. It was um, it was good for me as well to hear it again, having worked from the inside. I guess it's interesting to sort of bear witness now to hearing you talk about it. Um, uh, and I guess what. Uh, quite a lot of what you were saying goes from being sort of a set of principles or working guidelines to then think about how this morning I was sat re kind of revisiting the texts and it's really interesting how it becomes a live kind of uh, a live event now um, and how for me, how strikingly different each of the texts, each of the experiences seem to have been for the seers for this exhibition. Um, and so I wonder if um, we could bring in, um, I ha this proposed sort of list isn't an order. I mean, Janice, Helen, Deborah, it's up to you who wants to kind of speak <laughs> when um but uh i just wonder if anybody wants to kind of chip in straight away with just the kind of guts of the reaction of uh what it was like um <laughs> i was just gonna say as well if you start to say something you don't have to go on for 10 minutes no <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i've got my timer <laughs> I think for me, I mean, one thing now is, you know, the distance between having been involved in the project or in the residency and what is, you know, the, the gap, what's happened in between in terms of the world. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I haven't looked at this since I wrote it. And I deliberately thought, um, I, I, and also practically, you know, I didn't have the time and yeah, I've been teaching. Yeah. And in fact, my mother-in-law died on Monday. So that's another, oh, another oh, thing. Oh. Um, so there've been all sorts of situations that have kind of floored me a bit. And, you know, I'm in this kind of really, we're all in this precarious situation. But just, I've got the text up in front of me there and, and this sense of precarity, mm. <laughs> the precariousness of knowledge and looking. I think looking back now, it's confirming that, that that's where I was at the time. You know, how do I situate myself in relation to this practice, to these individuals, to their experience, to my own sense of what I think a seer is? Because that's really complicated, particularly given the kind of things that I'm looking at, you know, sort of feminist readings. How do you locate yourself mm. in relation to that? But I'm just sort of struck now, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, I'm just struck by the, the precarious nature of, of um, the experience we're in and how that's where I was in that space with that work at the time. And I didn't want to leave go of that sense of precariousness either I wanted to somehow 
somehow hold on to it, but it's not something you can hold on to. So I was in this kind of quite paradoxical space. And I think that was something I was interested in, in trying to explore. Um, so I kind of dipped in and out of playing intuitively with things I brought up. I mean, I did cheat a bit. I went into the space before I had my residency and I kind of feel like I did a lot of the work then. I spent a few hours um, just sitting and thinking and responding, letting myself respond intuitively to that space and to, to the, the images and ideas it conjured. So I was a little bit prepared in terms of materials when I actually went in and did the residency. I took, you know, fabric with me. I took... Well, I took it's things. not a militant model and in the in other models different researchers have different practices and some have to bring equipment that they've thought about ahead of time yeah so so i yeah so I kind of had a yes yeah, a scenario where i had some materials i had a sense of some of the things i wanted to try but i wanted to keep hold of a sense of possibility of things shifting and changing in the space as I, you know, responded to things that were happening in the moment. And I quite, I, I really like that place. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to write a PhD by publication at the moment. And I suppose that's the space that you're in, you know, if you know what you're doing really, then you're fucked, aren't you? So yeah. <laughs> you need to have a really open mind and find a route. So I was really conscious of that. I was quite open. So the idea of just going in with the stuff that was in my head and is in my head um, to the theoretical stuff, but bring that to this lived experience of being in the space. I think um, that's really interesting, Janice, because part of the way that um, Tracy was saying we work as a, as a, as collaborators is that often just following instinct feels too strong a instinct still feels like it's a, a known thing but um but it is that kind of uh, operating on the edges of knowing not quite knowing following a hunch following a feeling following a sense of uh whether tracy also feels like uh she's excited by something i'm getting a bit excited by and so forth and sometimes we refer to it as jamming off one another mm -hmm. that it's got mm -hmm. those ebbs and flows and rifts um and, and ruptures yeah and you so know. it's quite interesting that you approached your experience as a seers by by kind of also going off that sort of going with what you have and I, and and, and, it, and it's made me think about your think with your feet <laughs> line yeah. which I really yeah. like that that um uh that way of using it deliberately as a as an approach to research which is really uh welcomed by us as as kind of the makers of the exhibition that you were responding to it's a really nice I, symmetry there that was partly there because I am interested in running as a practice Oh. Um, and I've made some works working with running and I'm in a sort of little network with, I don't know if you know Kai Singh, who's at Manchester, um, who are looking, exploring running as a form of practice. So it, it, there is a little nod to that as well. But I was quite interested in sort of following that through a little bit in the text as well. So, you know, the idea of jamming, I was like, yeah, well, you've got, you've got the theoretical stuff and then you've got what happens, you know, and how do yeah. I sort of weave those two in and out so that's why i constructed the text in the way i did you know it's quite simple nice. really but you know how, in the space in one space in another space how how do i and in my own phd how do i situate myself in relation to all of this theoretical abstract mm -hmm. stuff and bring it back down to ground and how do i mirror that in in a form as well mm. so i was keen to bring it through into into the way the text was constructed. Um, so yeah, things like ooze and think with your feet and yeah. stuff. Yeah, you know, I know. think that, yeah, I really, I really enjoyed that. And that, that deliberate choice of um, vocabulary was, um, 
was really interesting and uh and i think uh what what's what's quite interesting is you've sort of talked about your way into being in the space and what struck me in deborah's piece was uh her text lending itself to, to to giving us a little bit of insight into the leaving of the experience um yeah. and i so it's so that's it's really interesting that um that you've got those kind of bookends i guess to the actual three hour residency so i wondered about if you could i was i don't want to put any words into your <laughs> your mouth here but i just would really love it if you could sort of um elaborate a little bit more about that end that depart point of departure for you from the the, the encounter um it was one of those things where i decided to have a little break and go for a, a coffee towards the end and i was sat opposite the glass tank and it was actually on leaving it and sitting opposite it that i reflected that i felt a sense of relief i felt quite oppressed within the the space and i'm not sure quite why i think it might be to do with i found the things to do with being feminine and education and the steps the social mobility i found perhaps i found all those things um a bit oppressive and i work within boundaries and movement so, so it, it all it, spoke it, to each other but yeah, I definitely felt a sense of relief as I walked out. I I was I was like surprised about how um, kind of oppressive that experience came for you. I know it's an exhausting experience because I've been a, a seer to somebody else's exhibition, and I, I had to just go home and and rest afterwards. But I was I was surprised by that, and I was also I I guess like. I don't know whether this is too too early to bring this into the conversation because we haven't heard from Helen yet or Deborah's full experience, but like that kind like Rhiannon said, Janice's experience of coming into the exhibition, your experience of leaving, but also Janice's kind of um test which is thinking through the fee. And I was very struck by Helen's resonance, which when um Helen said that her her experience as a as um related to geography is that it's a discipline that you feel through your feet mm. so i kind of really like this resonance of thinking through the feet feeling through the feet and these kind of journeys and also um i mean this is this is entering um probably enter some writing at some point but also in the chalk pit which obviously is our research and you know you're not privy to that um there were some like um feet discovered in the chalk pit from yeah. old iron age bodies so um from from burials and so and so the feet are quite and the journey and is quite prominent i think um, my experience of, of kind of going in and being in the space was very much like a journey. I felt like, I don't know if you've ever had that feeling where you, um, you set off on a massive long walk, like a several days walk, and you can really feel the weight of your rucksack. And then by about day four, you and your rucksack are part of, it's all part of you and you don't feel that weight anymore. I kind of felt like it was quite weighty to start with my experience of going into the exhibition because I, I kind of had this baggage with me and I felt like you know I've come in as a researcher as a geographer I'm not an artist I need to kind of somehow react to this exhibition that's very unfamiliar territory to me so I'll rely on the sort of tools of my trade if you like and measure things and write things in my field notebook and kind of try and get into a groove but then I just became a bit more confident because other people were starting to react. Uh, you feel like the rucksack's part of you and you kind of, you, you know, you can jump from stone to stone with confidence. And I felt like I kind of went through that really rapid journey um, in the exhibition that I went in, felt quite uncomfortable, but I had my rucksack. So it's kind of, you know, the possessions in my rucksack came out and I tried to experience the exhibition as a geographer and tried to be as objective as possible 
and then that became a journey in itself changing from that that attempt at objectivity to it becoming much more subjective sort of over the course because uh, so as an example of that asking people to help me use the Munsell soil color chart which is a yeah. kind of an international standard of different colors and to try and apply that to um, the chalk which you know you would just say it's white um, well, actually, we can frame that in a code and to talk about the, the whiteness and the light kept changing and people kept giving me different answers as to how white that, that white was. Um, but also, um, as a geographer, I've worked extensively with flint and chalk because I worked for an archaeology unit at Oxford University that studied the deposits mapped as clay with flints. And so I'm used to the sound of flint. And one of the things that archaeologists can tell about flints is if they've been in a fire and if they have a particular ring to them, because um, Paleolithic, Mesolithic people would fire flints so that they would nap more predictably when they're making stone tools. So I was interested in your idea about, you know, feet and Bronze Age um, mm. remnants being found in that chalk landscape. So part of my training is to look at a landscape and to try and form a kind of reconstruction and to try and separate what's human from what's natural and so I kind of so try kind of to go into the exhibition. Go into the exhibition. I'm getting a lot of feedback. From someone. I'm getting feedback. Um, oh. Yeah so so trying to go into the exhibition and and be objective um, and reconstruct some elements of it I felt was kind of part of my role as a geographer but in trying to do that reconstruction it really highlighted how it's absolutely impossible to be objective <laughs> and uh, but that became a really nice connection to other people and source of, of um, interest in dialogue um, so there was one guy, a heating engineer, that went past. He'd mended my radiator earlier in the week, so I recognised him and hauled him into the exhibition. He was like, no, I don't do art. You know, I'm really <laughs> not interested, all this modern stuff. And I said, there must be one thing you can connect with, you know, just tell me what it is. I said, how, how about look over here at the steps that Deborah was mentioning, the steps with the tights and the chalk blocks. And he just said, oh, that's a bag of onions and a smelly old kipper because there was a fish at the top of the steps and I just couldn't believe that that's what he saw because he refused to see and it was really interesting to me that people just you know they come with their own subjective kind of ideas about what actual objects are and therefore refuse to see what they are yeah um but then I said, well, there must be something else that you can really relate to. And that's when he noticed that the screws in the steps weren't fully countersunk. <laughs> and I just thought, you know, that's something that he's, it, he's got real expertise in, is this kind of construction and staircases and things like that. And uh, so, yeah, he, he did begin to see after a while. So that was a nice sort of point of connection. But Renis, uh, the resonances and, and also some of the, the kind of experiential things as as a researcher i'd like um you know with with um deborah's ex experience of it um because it because i i know like several years ago um i was doing research with the university of bergen and they used a model that I had not witnessed in um, UK education where all the students were, were researching at the side of their professors. And I, I know this is slightly different because you're in your own space in there, but it, it was really for me like a, um, a wonderful non-hierarchical -hier um, experience in research. I mean, I, I found it, you know, it elevated me you know, it made me feel that, um, you know, I was being accepted almost, that um, my opinions were valid and my of thoughts. Course, yeah, and of course. Right. Yeah, yeah, no, of course, of course they are. And um, but I think the space does that, doesn't it? It democratises, it sort of allows everybody's opinion. You know, anyone 
can walk into that space. It might be the heating engineer. It might be an artist whose, you know, work is similar to your to your own. It it can be anyone at any level from any discipline. I think that's yeah. why it's it's nice that it's permeable. You can kind of wander in and out. And yes, I didn't yeah, know I was... you were a um, a student, Deborah. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and and i think you know that that's that's wonderful that because also it gives a different experience and a different voice from within the educational framework i mean i'm outside of the educational framework as well deborah so like it, it's kind of a space for all the voices to me and i'm really sorry i've noticed that janice isn't here yeah it, it, it's one of those things where sometimes the as you're learning and you're, I mean, for me, the steps were about going up, you know, working mm -hmm. your way up. And um, sometimes language can be a barrier. And I found that really interesting, like reading through both the texts, there was a different language that, you know, you've used as, you know, professionals compared to myself as a, a student. And it was really at the beginning of your text, um because mm, yeah. obviously i'm independent but i work in he contests it was really um and you get used to using a different language i guess i guess it's what you call social coding for different contexts and this this like professional language that's expected this poetic language that's expected there's like um, nuts and bolts language that's expected when you're communicating in different aspects. And I really like that, that you came into your text mm. with no holds barred and said, that writing was crap. Yeah. It didn't open anything <laughs> up. That was the subtext, you know, and that's, <laughs> and, and I wasn't offended by that. No, it made me smile. It. I liked, I liked that. I did. Because I, I like. I, I find sometimes when I read others' words, I find that I can't access. You know, I have it, I've got exactly the same experiences as what you were describing. Um, and it kind of made me think, yes, that's part of where that desire in my practice to rupture uh, writing comes from, is that feeling that I have been unable to access the written language myself so it was kind of like it was really it was really interesting that you started with that saying that our work had that kind of um barrier for you and then that versus your experience in the space was really really interesting to yeah. to, to read about because i first of all i think you know like when you exhibit the curators become alarmed when you're not providing text mm. of course they do because they're they're public facing um and so we didn't really want to provide any and then when we did want to provide any we wanted it to be so full of holes and spaces that people could bring their own meaning to it but it, it was really it was really kind of really a wonderful refreshing thing for you to say well that yeah it didn't didn't enhance my um no no and you know we're looking at it from one perspective but you've got the public coming in and if they can't access the text then you know you're marginalizing them so that yes it, yes and and there, there are massive issues of access which I always kind of struggle with because I want my investigation to be my investigation, <laughs> how my head works. But of course you, you want to open it up to other people and then, and then there's some kind of like, some things you have to let go of or you have to change and stuff like that. But I, but I just coming back to not our text, but all the text, I, I thought, not i'm not talking about what was written i'm talking about how it was written it was very very different deborah yours is very kind of um when i say nuts and bolts i don't mean simple 
what I mean is yours is very it's grounded in life experience um overtly I mean all all text the subtext is grounded in life experience but like it's grounded in life experience it's tack 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 you know and no nonsense it's sleeves rolled up and <laughs> you know it's the the text is a customer you know like it's it, like you've sat that text <laughs> in your previous life in the seat and yeah and and you've just like dealt with it you know and and then there, there was kind of janice's text that was on the on the page it's it's left to right it comes down the page as you expect but it's the pacing of the paragraphs and the spaces between where she's left a lot of spaces for the mind to wander onto the next paragraph like spatially the way that she's laid the text out and then helen's text came through like as as two voices that are interrelated mm -hmm. so there's 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 kind of there's one entity but there's two voices that are in connecting all the way down the page so to me the 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 written text was very different apart from apart from what was said in the text and um i found that quite illuminating and quite refreshing um across the across the different ones and of course we don't we don't know what will come from kate or whether it will be the end up being the the um playlist alone which which is an amazing way into text in its own right as well and 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 it's audio not written you know so it, it's like i think that would be really cool actually if she just simply refuses to give you some text like you've refused to give her some text by taking yes, text yes. out of your own exhibition and yes. demanding of us that we all produce text she might just say do you know what no <laughs> yeah, yeah I, know, I know and and the thing is this this the kind, the kind of place for it as well is not to squash and, and contain everything. It's like totally the process and the exhibition and the research, it's totally open to subversion. You know, we, we all like it when it goes off script and off the page. <laughs> but, but yeah, so, so I, I, I think... Sorry, it, it is interesting, the sort of openness of it. And, and that was something that I wanted to try and work with as a form in the text and in my relationship with it. And I'm just thinking about what Deborah's saying about accessibility. And, you know, I, I kind of agree that, you know, for me, I, I have to, all I can do, you know, without being a sort of dominant force through the work, so trying to avoid being a dominant force in the work is to just present gaps for people to negotiate on their own terms. And I think it is a problem when we have to, that we assume that we can second guess how someone else might read what we've done and then yeah. reinterpret it for that assumption. I think, I yeah. think that's really dangerous. And I think what is interesting about Deborah's reaction is that sense of not being able to feel what, what it feels like to not feel initially grounded by something and I think that's that's what fascinated me about the work um, that it really was about that and I think that that is quite a hard thing to to deal with because you have an expectation in a public space particularly in a you know a university that uh, you will be given, you know, yeah, you will yeah, be told. Yeah. And I really like the fact that no one's telling anyone what to think, you know. Well, it, 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 what you pick up on is that the screws are, are not countersunk. That's, there's, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. No. You know, and I thought it was picking. quite, I thought it was quite interesting that, that he saw a bag of onions yeah, you know, a net of onions, and that Deborah, in her writing, has said it reminded 
of somebody throwing a lap full of onions down the stairs. Yeah. I think you said that. You might have said potatoes, but I think it was onions. Apples. Oh. Apples, sorry. Yeah. But, that, but that kind of like, it's really so grounded in the everyday. Mm. And, and I like the fact that, that like something that's a little bit unfamiliar and opaque is, is not beyond being grounded in somebody else's life experience or memory that is a trigger mm. um so i you know hopefully yeah can it just... can hook in on on some level and like you said janice it's, it's all valid there's mm. there's nothing less valid about somebody seeing a net of onions or a counter sunk screw as you paid attention to the frayed edge mm. you know there's 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 no there's no difference in value at the resonances and and also some of the the kind of experiential things as as a researcher i'd like um you know with with um deborah's ex experience of it um because it because i i know like several years ago um i was doing research with the University of Bergen and they used a model that I had not witnessed in um, UK education where all the students were, were researching at the side of their professors. And I, I know this is slightly different because you're in your own space in there, but it, it was really for me like a, um, a wonderful non-hierarchical -hier um, experience in research. I mean, I, I found it, you know, it elevated me, you know, it made me feel that, um, you know, I was being accepted almost, that um, my opinions were valid and my of thoughts. Course, yeah, and That's of course, great. yeah, yeah, no, of course, of course they are. And um, but I think the space does that, doesn't it? It democratizes, it sort of allows everybody's opinion, you know, anyone can walk into that space it might be the heating engineer it might be an artist whose you know work is similar to your to your own it, it can be anyone at any level from any discipline I think that's yeah. why it's it's nice that it's permeable you can kind of wander in and out and yes I didn't yeah, know I you were a, um, a student Deborah yeah so yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and and I think you know that that's that's wonderful that because also it gives a different experience and a different voice from within the educational framework. I mean, I'm outside of the educational framework as well, Deborah. So like, it, it's kind of a space for all the voices to me. And I'm really sorry, I've noticed that Janice isn't here. Yeah. It, it, it's one of those things where sometimes the, as you're learning and you're, I mean, for me, the steps were about going up you know working mm -hmm. your way up and um sometimes language can be a barrier and i found that really interesting like reading through both the texts there was a different language that you know you've used as you know professionals compared to myself as uh, a student and it was really at the beginning of your text um because mm. yeah. obviously i'm independent but i work in he contests it was really, um, and you get used to using a different language. I guess, I guess it's what you call social coding for different contexts. And this, this like professional language that's expected, this poetic language that's expected, this like um, nuts and bolts language that's expected when you're communicating in different aspects. And I really like that, that you came into your text mm -hmm. with no holds barred and said, that writing was crap. Yeah. It didn't open anything up. <laughs> that was the subtext, you know, and that's, <laughs> and, and I wasn't offended by that. No, it made me smile. It. I liked, I liked that. I did. Because I, I, liked, I, I find sometimes when I read others' words, I find that I can't access, you know, I have, I've got exactly the same experiences as what you were describing um and it kind of made me think yes that's part of where that 
desire in my practice to rupture uh, writing comes from is that feeling that I have been unable to access the written language myself. So it was kind of like, it was really, it was really interesting that you started with that saying that our work had that kind of um, barrier for you. And then that versus your experience in the space was really, really interesting to, yeah. to, to read about. Because I, first of all, I think, you know, like when you exhibit, the curators become alarmed when you're not providing text. Mm. Of course they do because they're, they're public facing. Um, and so we didn't really want to provide any. And then when we did want to provide any, we wanted it to be so full of holes and spaces that people could bring their own meaning to it but it, it was really it was really kind of really a wonderful refreshing thing for you to say well that yeah it didn't didn't enhance my um no no and, you know we're looking at it from one perspective but you've got the public coming in and if they can't access the text then you know, you're marginalising them, so that's... Yes, it, yes, and, and there, there are massive issues of access, which I always kind of struggle with because I want my investigation to be my investigation, <laughs> how my head works, but of course you you want to open it up to other people and then, and then there's some kind of like, some things you have to let go of or you have to change and stuff like that but I but I just coming back to not our text but all the text I I thought not I'm not talking about what was written I'm talking about how it was written was very very different Deborah yours is very kind of um when I say nuts and bolts I don't mean simple what I mean is yours is very it's grounded in life experience um overtly i mean all all text the subtext is grounded in life experience but like it's grounded in life experience it's tack 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 you know and no nonsense it's sleeves rolled up and <laughs> you know it's the the text is a customer you know like it's it, like you've sat that text <laughs> in your previous life in the sea and yeah and and you've just like dealt with it you know and and then there, there was kind of janice's text that was on the on the page it's it's left to right it comes down the page as you expect but it's the pacing of the paragraphs and the spaces between where she's left a lot of spaces for the mind to wander onto the next paragraph, like spatially, the way that she's laid the text out. And then Helen's text came through like as, as two voices that are interrelated. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, there's kind of, there's one entity, but there's two voices that are in connecting all the way down the page so to me the 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 written text was very different apart from apart from what was said in the text and um i found that quite illuminating and quite refreshing um across the, across the different ones and of course we don't we don't know what will come from kate or whether it will be the end up being the the um playlist alone which which is an amazing way into text in its own right as well and 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 it's audio not written you know so it, it's like i think that would be really cool actually if she just simply refuses to give you some text like you've refused to give her some text by taking yes, text yes. out of your own exhibition and yes. demanding of us that we all produce texts she might just say do you know what no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I know. And, and the thing is, this, this, 
the kind the kind of place for it as well is not to squash and, and contain everything it's like totally the process and the exhibition and the research it's totally open to subversion you know we we all like it when it goes off script and off the page <laughs> but but yeah so so i, I think, I think Sorry, it, it is interesting, the sort of openness of it. And, and that was something that I wanted to try and work with as a form in the text and in my relationship with it. And I'm just thinking about what Deborah's saying about accessibility. And, you know, I, I kind of agree that, you know, for me, I, I have to, all I can do, you know, without being a sort of dominant force through the work, so trying to avoid being a dominant force in the work is to just present gaps for people to negotiate on their own terms. And I think it is a problem when we have to, that we assume that we can second guess how someone else might read what we've done and then yeah. reinterpret it for that assumption. I think, I yeah. think that's really dangerous. And I think what is interesting about Deborah's reaction is that sense of not being able to feel what, what it feels like to not feel initially grounded by something and I think that's that's what fascinated me about the work um, that it really was about that and I think that that is quite a hard thing to to deal with because you have an expectation in a public space particularly in a you know a university that uh, you will be given, you know, yeah, you will yeah, be told. Yeah. And I really like the fact that no one's telling anyone what to think, you know. Well, it, 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 what you pick up on is that the screws are, are not countersunk. That's, there's, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. No. You know, and I thought it was quite, I was, thought it was quite interesting that, that he saw a bag of onions yeah. yeah, a net of onions, and that Deborah, in her writing, has said it reminded of somebody throwing a lap full of onions down the stairs. Yeah. I think you said that. You might have said potatoes, but I think it was onions. Apples. Oh. Apples. Sorry. Yeah. But that, but that kind of like, it's read so grounded in the everyday, mm. and and I like the fact that that like something that's a little bit unfamiliar, and opaque, is is not beyond being grounded in somebody else's life experience or memory that is a trigger. Mm. Um, so I, you know, hopefully yeah. can it just... can hook in on, on some level. And like you said, Janice, it's, it's all valid. There's, mm. there's nothing less valid about somebody seeing a net of onions or a countersunk screw as you paid attention to the frayed edge mm -hmm. you know there, there's 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 no there's no difference in value we're just talking yeah. about parallel or systems yeah. or, or dialogical systems but not value value the values yeah. inherent in all of it the problem yeah. is in the institutions in which the work was framed and in which you know most of us are studying or working is paradoxically those value judgments are placed so they placed on people so they shut down that way of opening up the yeah. thought process to the unexpected that you know we say that they shouldn't but they are there in the background there, yes, there's always yeah, a hierarchy. Yeah. I mean even in that building itself it's like a bloody cathedral you know it's like, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, we all know why yeah. cathedrals were built. Well, why are universities being built like that, you know, yeah. now? Yeah. And, it, and, it, and so the space has that kind of, it, you know, the, the whole context can be intimidating. Yeah. yeah. So if you then go in and you see something that is not giving you answers, it's, it's trying to open up this, this space. It's sometimes, it can ring as a bit of a contradiction. So yes. it's not. Not a criticism of, uh, that doesn't sound anything like criticism of the work. No, it's just no. not observation of how the context and the contradictions in how we, you know, in that sense, experience education. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think it, as well. It, it's not easy to pitch 
work that's open to these kind of institutionalized institutional frameworks so i always i always think there's a little little spark of either bravery when an institution engages with that because they're they're within a grouping of other institutions looking across to each other and then there's a little out of step when they engage with true openness so i i just you know and i i feel like i feel in a very precarious and a very privileged position as an independent trying to work in and through mm. HA because I, you know, we, we should shape the institutions. Um, and that's harder because you have to create a culture. <laughs> it's like not one person. And I just, and I just see this as, as feeding into that of, of being able to develop the culture and, and to develop the thinking. Um, Was there anything that you feel as artists that you could have done um, to make it clearer to people that you were making an open exhibition, subverting text so that other people could come and experience in a particular way and to sort of because I feel like I was in a really privileged position as a seer that I was allowed to go in, move things, touch yeah. things and really engage. But actually other people weren't in that yeah. position. All they could do was walk around. There was no explanatory text. So is there something that you feel in hindsight you could have done to engage people more that were just passing and not in there as a seer? I, th I think at the moment... Um... I can't identify what the extra things are. So we would be open to feedback on that because um, we engage with the institution and the curator and they go through their marketing platforms. They have all the information. And we went through marketing platforms also like social media. But I think, I think there is something about us being from independent and Rhiannon from a different institution, we're not based on site where you're making personal relationships and having face-to-face -face conversations that I think could have built that a little bit more. Um, but I would definitely, or we would definitely be open to suggestions of how to make that a less privileged experience i mean i think i would be really interested to know uh, what the title was you know your title was that diagram mm -hmm. and i sort of so i went into a whole pile of software to try and find out what that diagram was whether it was estrogen progesterone or some other hormone or it, it that's the closest i could get it was those and yeah. i was thinking maybe the title so when i saw that it was hexagons i brought along some pictures from my beekeeping and sort of put these beekeeping pictures near the title as a, to try and bring people in because I thought they might kind of relate those hexagons to beekeeping and they might just kind of walk in because mm -hmm. they saw that and, image and that didn't I, have any I did effect. That <laughs> you know like when, when we decided to use that I, I you know it it reminded me also of that, you know, and the linkages where the cells are attached to each other. It was actually um, a diagram of a calcite. Of a what? Oh, calcite. calcite. Oh. Yeah, yeah, which is also of, of um, so it also relates to other like materials. So it would also probably relate to eggshell as well as chalk, as well as this, because all these things, the way that I understand them, are are calcium carbonates, but but the the structure bonds in different ways to create different materials, and so this was the base structure of the calcite. Uh, I started with that, and I couldn't find it linked, so I started with gypsum and calcite and things mm -hmm. like that, and couldn't get it to yeah. link to that diagram. So it, sorry, sorry, Janice. Yeah, I encapsulate yeah. the metaphor for how you encounter the work, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Yes. 
yeah. it was. And also the, the place in it, we spent quite a bit of time thinking about where to place the title. So not to place it where you would usually expect titles for exhibitions to be located. Um, uh, and to kind of think about uh, it graphically and where we wanted to put it. And we did debate, didn't we, about even having it on at all or whether we had it in different types yeah. of places. And it ended up, again, feeling our way through the curatorial process to, to sit it in that corner. Mm -hmm. um, but, but to me, it makes more sense now as a sediment as well for it to be lower down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, um, can I just go back to the um the the dis the mention of the apples in that oh, yeah. um Deborah. yeah that was uh, talking about and thinking about those kind of things you bring in a like with you to these experiences what reading your text did for me was also change my position as artist which was really enjoyable to to kind of be witnessing uh, the experience that you had. So it kind of made me feel like I wasn't the the maker, but more the witness. Or or um, and that was really uh, interesting for me, and I've really enjoyed that uh, being placed in the position of not knowing rather than supposedly as the maker of this thing, I should be knowing what I'm doing. And then the other thing that I, I've really enjoyed is where parts of our process, as much as we considered the, ex the exhibition to be re research uh, and, and we curated some pieces while we were installing as well so there's always this sense of continual um research and development but what was really nice was even reading your texts i was still then being put back into different times of our research process so the reference to the um video of uh the the rock the chalk in the apron May and in the description to the linking with apples made me remember that on one of the first days when Tracy and I were starting to collaborate, as a gesture, Tracy had left me an apple on the staircase where we then made that film. So there are all these really kind of um, happy coincidences that. Uh, that are now coming coming through that if we deliberately made those connections or made those things more oh yeah we knew that or oh yeah that's why we did that the, then it wouldn't it wouldn't have this kind of feeling of real pleasure that it's doing for me again is that there's all these moments of discoveries and synergies that are coming through which um which is just lovely because I'd completely forgotten and actually we've got some uh, photographs of the apple core over time rotting while we were working on the staircase, the staircase. developing that developing film work. work. So, and there's no trace of apples in that film at all. Yet for you, it very much did connect back to that so I was like whoa that's that's just really freaky um uh so I really enjoyed that you know and and it remind it, it made me think that actually that sense of pouring out your thoughts or your your responses to things uh is really valuable because often something that might seem quite small can be of big you know have a big connection to something else to something else um, um I'm actually, actually, the apple was a turning point because i can remember um you know you, you come to residency first day we'd never worked together before and like we were having like we'd had a previous conversation before we started about you know what writing is what can it be and stuff like that and i can remember it's <laughs> And it, nothing, 
quite satisfied us and I can remember and how the direct the little stabs in the directions were going and I can remember you sitting on the stairs eating the apple that I'd left us and you said it's going to get physical isn't it and I said yeah 